Okay, so um, yeah, what I will discuss is some uh, joint work with uh, Alex uh, Kontorovich uh, on uh, the Rembas uh, problem. So we haven't solved we haven't <coughs> solved the problem completely, but uh, still there is an interesting result, and uh, I believe it's also using some interesting methods. So what is the what is the problem? Uh, well, we are con we are uh, considering continued fraction expansions of uh, rational numbers. And uh, basically, uh, the question is to show that um, if I give you any uh, denominator uh, d, then uh, you can find a b so that in this continued fraction expansion, uh, the, the, con the, um, the a's, the, a, the aj's, are going to be bounded by some, say, absolute constant. And I will come back on that. So, in other words, um, I don't know if there is a pointer here or not. No, 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 no. no. anyway. So, uh, we are, you know how to use this? There should be a pointer because there is, there is a something here. Ah, it's in the center? Maybe it's out of, yeah? No. Well, there seems to be some device on top. Ah, maybe you know. Do you know, do you know how to get a point from this? Maybe there is none. Yeah, it's a little bit... Uh, there's no problem. Uh, yeah. I, I Oh yeah, no, it's not. It's not that uh, not that uh, essential. I can show. Okay. So uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Okay. So what we are considering, what we are considering is um, the following set. We're taking the set array of fractions b over d, uh, with the property that uh, the the continued fraction expansion is uniformly bounded by capital A. So, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. And then we are looking at uh, the the projection. So we are we are taking uh, all the denominators of uh, these fractions in um, in the set array. And what we like to say is that uh, there is um, okay, there <laughs> oh boy, yeah. <laughs> this is your private one. Uh, so where, where do you push here? Ah, here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what we like to say is that uh, <coughs> so there is some absolute constant a uh, with a property that uh, when we are considering the denominators d of the fractions in the set uh, script r a, so we call this set uh, d a, then in fact this set d a is going to be all of the integers. So there are various formulations of this. No, uh, no, 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 no. So what, what is okay, so d a are just the denominators yeah. of fractions with the continued b over d for which the continued fraction expansion is going bound. to is, is bounded by, by the capital A. What? Whether there exists an A. No, 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 no. In the next line, the definition is there is two for every Ah, there, there is B. B. Yeah, yeah, sure. There is a Boy, B. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, okay, now I'm getting worried because it's going to be worse at some point. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, well, I mean, Zaremba formulated uh, the, the problem with A equals 5, observing that apparently 54, it's not in D4. He never calculated it. Um, so you will find other papers. For instance, there is a recent quite interesting paper by Kurt McMillan where um, this, um, this problem is put in a slightly broader uh, context. Uh, in in fact, I learned, I learned about the question from, uh, from him. And there, the, the conjecture would be stated, say, with, with an A, which is just an absolute constant. 
that I mean, so far there is no contraindication why a equals five should work. And actually, there is um, apparently, according to numerics, even the possibility that the set D2 may work up to uh, finitely many exceptions, perhaps. So what was known about this uh, problem? Well, there are special cases that uh, have been uh, established. In particular, there is work by Niederreiter, uh, who shows that, for instance, if you take Ds of the form 2 to the power j, or other numbers of this kind, 3 to the power j, or something like that, then there is a method to construct, uh, construct the Bs and to prove that, in fact, uh, such numbers are always in, uh, in D3. Now, these techniques are, if you want, they are, they are explicit constructions, uh, this, this folding algorithm, which are quite different from the techniques I'm going to use uh, in this talk, which are, um, which are really uh, based on, um, on dynamics in groups and uh, understanding group orbits, very much in the, in the spirit of uh, what one does uh, in the study of expansion and so on. And eventually, uh, what is going to, to drive, uh, to, to lead to the, the result I'm talking to, it's a combination of number theoretic uh, techniques and the uh, information you get, say, from the thermodynamical approach. So, so does this work for 3 to the J2 or just very Yeah, small? yeah, no, 3 to the J are special things. No, 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 no 3, I, I believe 3 to the J, I don't know all the no, results. Not known. No, no, it's known. 3 oh. to the J is known and also other things. No, I don't know what is the, the full catalog there. But they, these are very special uh, cases, very special, cases. Very special very sequences. Very, very, very sparse, they are very yeah. sparse. So that's, now just to make sure I understand, this says that there for every J there exists. It a means B. that for every J there, there is a B, B but with the continued fraction of B over never, 2 to the B J. Bigger than three. <laughs> Not bigger than 3. Yeah, and in fact it's constructed. Um, in fact, this construction is also taken up in Macmillan's paper in the context of uh, of quadratic number fields. Uh, it's now, I think different B's, I'm not going to get this, right? So, so it's, oh, yeah. is that, that's a specific B that I'm going to get? Well, there are, there are still going to be many of them, there you know, be many B's. but not all of them. Not all of them. So, in fact, uh, just to say a few things, um, Zaremba's motivation, which is a paper in the 70s, was really an applied motivation because what they were caring about was the construction, explicit constructions, of points which are well distributed in higher dimensional intervals. So if you are in a one dimensional interval, there's not too much mystery around it, but how do you uh, distribute endpoints, say, in the, the unit square in such a way that the discrepancy is as small as possible? Of course, first you have to know how far you can go. I, I will tell you that. But so anyway, this was his motivation. Also, there was a motivation. So that kind of problem of, of finding uh, systems which are well distributed uh, are, is, is important uh, to numerical integration, for instance. Uh, the other context where uh, the, uh, the problem of these continued fractions uh, comes up, it's when you study uh, the distribution, distributional properties uh, of uh, the linear congruential uh, number generator. So this is in the context of pseudo-random numbers. This is discrepancy over, over, over boxes or what? Or over uh, non, uh, over how do you say, rectangular boxes. Rectangular not just, not just uh, how do you say, square. square. Rectangular okay. boxes. Okay. That's, that's any rectangular. Any rectangular, that's important. So I mean, this is just a, I mean, a standard thing here is that you can if you're talking about numerical integration, there is a standard inequality which tells you that if f is a decent function with a control uh, on the L1 norms of the mixed uh, first order derivatives, which they call the variation, then you have a control. You have an approximation of uh, the, the integral by a discrete sum over your set of points with an, um, an upper bound that will carry, of course, something that depends on, on the function f, which is this uh, higher, uh, higher order variation, times the, di the discrepancy of the sequence, the way I just defined it. Okay, this is a standard fact. So s was equal to what fraction? Uh, where is it an s? Let's see. Uh, what? Is there an s? I don't see. Ah, okay, so what you're doing is that you take the, the partial derivatives 
with respect to a subset of the variables, order one. Look, if we are, let's say we are in S is equal to two, okay? Then we have the partial derivative with respect to x1, with respect to x2, and uh, with respect to x1 and x2. Just what you need to reconstruct, essentially you want to reconstruct your function f using rectangles. So the weight you're going to get is expressed by this v. It's just partial integration, basically. So now, what did Zaremba prove? Well, he showed that uh, if we take the following set of points in the square, so we are taking j over d. I mean, this is the natural thing to do. j goes from 1 up to d. And then you, uh, you multiply here with b. So you do a reduction, mod 1. Uh, you get a sequence there in the square which discrepancy is going to be bounded by a log d over d up to an, um, a prefactor here that is clearly going to depend on, on this capital A which is the bound on the continuous fraction expansion. So there you see that it's of some interest to have a control of that. And by the way, yeah, what, what, what I should say is that, um, where is this here? Uh, there is an, uh, a result by um, Schmidt, which has an interesting history also, which will tell you that this is really a two-dimensional phenomenon, or higher dimensional. Uh, if I give you any sequence of n points in the square, the discrepancy is going to be at least log n over n. And of course it's rectangular. <coughs> what? Rectangular, of course. Rectangular. And and we, what? Yes, of course. But rectangular is what is apparently of, of significance for this uh, numerical integration thing. So anyway, what uh, I just showed you is that uh, this particular um, model will realize you the optimal discrepancy provided, of course, we have a control on A. Now, the other thing is the, the linear congruential pseudo-random number generator in the homogeneous form. So the general form is that uh, you... <coughs> you multiply, so you do uh, modular arithmetics mod d, you multiply with b, so you have x, you go to bx plus c, say. In the present case, the c is, is put to zero. So these are sequences which are extremely uh, easy to, to calculate with, uh, with, with very little memory. They are not very good, uh, these kind of sequences are not very good uh, if you want to do numerical integration, for instance. But they are quite good if you just try to, uh, uh, they are not also good for, for security purposes, but they are quite good if you don't have much memory and you just want to, to produce something uh, to, um, for instance, um, what I understood is uh, uh, to simulate a video game or, or a slot machine or something like that. So basically it, uh, it has certain features of randomness, as we will see. Uh, although it doesn't have some requirements of security which are available for other constructions. But in any case, the point is that knowing that you have, okay, so what we do is that we're taking the powers of B in this case, we reduce uh, uh, mod D, and we like to understand what are the statistical properties uh, of, the, of the sequence we have here. So we can start looking at the statistical properties of X1, and then we can start, we can also look at the pair correlation and higher order correlations. Now, what it turns out, if we take, say, assume that you take a B, which is primitive mod D, then the B at the power J is basically going to run over all the residues mod D. So when you look at that, you are really getting back to the previous one. So in other words, if we, uh, if, if we uh, have a D, say a prime number, and we take a B, which is primitive mod D, and such that uh, b over d has uh, bounded uh, partial quotients, then we get that the discrepancy uh, of that sequence x2, what they call the serial correlation of pairs, is actually going to be bounded by basically the same number as, as what is here. Now, actually, as a matter of fact, before or, or thing, there was not a single example of that. So our theorem, say, is strong enough to produce uh, say infinitely many primes d and uh, b's which are uh, primitive uh, mod d uh, for which that your continued fraction is going to remain bounded by 
same number. Uh, I think the number we got was 50 or something, or 51. So uh, these are just um, uh, examples of numerical plots uh, for which they do not bear any responsibility. But uh, what you see is that this looks like something reasonably well distributed. And it <laughs> comes from, uh, even from, especially from a distance, uh, it comes from it's the... It's not possible at random, or is it? Well, what you want is to have small discrepancies. So in other words, when you take a box, basically the contribution, uh, well, I mean, yeah. contribution of the box is going to be, so uh, compared with the area, is right. going to be quite small, the, the, I mean, the best would be one over the number of points, and this is almost as good up to a logarithmic factor. Your affinity box would be terrible. Well, <laughs> you see, it may be slightly, I mean, no, 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 but don't, yeah, I mean, it may be an illusion when you are at a certain distance, but when you're close, you see that it's not quite like that. <laughs> In any case, D is a prime number. Yes. Yeah, these boxes have to be parallel to some axis. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So D, D is a prime number. B is primitive mod D, apparently. And the continued fraction expansion is not bad at all. On the other hand, if you take somebody like that, so we still have uh, the same D. No, B, B is still primitive, primitive element uh, mod the D. But you see that there is a bad, uh, I mean, continued fraction. It's, it's, not, it's not small. I mean, there are some, some large guys. The picture you get is much worse. Well, if you say this is not good, you have to admit that this one is even much <laughs> worse. Okay. So, um, so what is the theorem? What we prove is that uh, with A equals 50, you're going to have everything up to an exceptional set with almost a power saving. Don't take this thing too seriously. The truth is that we didn't try too hard to get rid of it. Anyway, the result you have there, although it's not 100% obvious, is sufficiently good to, uh, to fit whatever the, the needs of the linear congruential map, namely find, finding, uh, well, R51 is going to contain infinitely many fractions, B over D, where D is prime, B is primitive mod D, which is what you need in, uh, in that thing. Most denominators work, right? It says most denominators work, but still you need to have a little bit room because B has to be chosen primitive mod D. So how do we get B primitive mod D? Well, we're going to make sure that D minus 1 doesn't have too many divisors. But there is room because you have a lot, a very small error. And then we ha also have to use that for, for D fixed, we don't have one B, but we have, in fact, many Bs. This is just part of the, the argument. So what is um, one of the things which is important uh, are the continued fraction counter sets of um, numbers in 0, 1 with bounded partial quotients. So here we are not restricting ourselves to rationals, but we take all real numbers in 0, 1, which uh, uh, partial quotients are bounded, say, by capital A. Now for A equals 1, it's not very, uh, it's not, uh, not very interesting. But then uh, already for A equals 2, you get an interesting counter set, which has a dimension which is just a little bit above a half. And this is why, say, the, the Hensley conjecture with an, uh, with an A equals 2 makes sense, because it's not completely out of question, say, say in view of Maastricht projection theorems or whatever, that although the set is, I mean, the, the, the set of fractions is really a, a thin set in some sense, it's dimension just above a half, once you start projecting, that perhaps you will get, uh, you may no, get. I, I Yes. So this is, these are infinite continued fractions. So you should see it as the Hausdorff dimension of a set in 0, 1. So it's important that this is just a bit above a half. Otherwise, you would immediately see that the D2 thing cannot be true. And what is important for the, so this was um, a particular study by, by these authors using the thermodynamical method, which is also something I'm going to use say, in, in a more refined form in some sense, in order to get information I need about uh, my set. Now, what is the most important thing is the fact that when A is getting large, then this dimension is going to go to 1. And there is a precise formula which is due to Hensley. 
So um, a few more things. When I uh, speak about delta, this is the this is uh, the the delta which is which is uh, written here. This is the dimension of the of the Cantor set in zero one. So what Hensley proved is that if we go back to the rationals now, B over D, uh, which are in RA, so continued fraction bounded by A, and we want B and D bounded by N, then the number of elements in RAN is going to be of the order of N at the power 2 delta. I guess this is not very surprising because you're basically going to look at the box dimension at scale 1 over N square. So you see the point, the, the n at the power 2 delta with the delta, which is just over a half, is going to give you something which is more than 1. So perhaps after you project out in the d, you're still going to have a full set. I don't know how much serious numerics there is. Anyway, uh, this is something uh, which is hard to prove. Uh, what is obvious, or almost obvious, uh, is that certainly the size of dan is at least n at the power delta. And why is that? Well, if we take a fraction b over d in Ra, and we take any element a in A, then you're going to have that both d and b plus a, d are in dA. So we just look at the map which is going to send, which is, which, which is going to go uh, from Ra to dA times dA is going to map b over d in d and b plus a, d. So this map is, is a nice map. So we definitely have the same dimension n at the power 2 delta in the image, which means that the projection on dA has to be at least dimension n at, I mean, has to contain at least a number of elements which is n at the power delta, right? So this is a very, a very simple argument. Of course, you expect better. Now, using some slightly more sophisticated mathematics and sometimes much more sophisticated, what you can prove is that in fact, the cardinality of dAn is going to be larger than n at the power delta prime for some delta prime, which is strictly larger than delta. Uh, in the case when a is equal to 2, delta is more than a half, and then you can even write an explicit formula. This is not completely trivial, by the way. Now, what I'm going to talk about is the result, which is a slightly more general version of it, uh, about getting essentially everything. If you take any alphabet A and you assume that delta A is bigger than 0 0.9 something, right, which is going to be the case if the alphabet uh, script A consists of the, uh, of the integers, say, bounded by, by 51 or so, then actually you're going to have all the integers up to very small error. It would be nice to get rid of this error, but that's another matter. Look, look, I think one can probably get a power saving, but we didn't really. No, 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 we did not. Uh. The problem is that we are borrowing things from el el somewhere else and we don't want to, uh, to work too hard. So these are some pictures here uh, my collaborator is proud of, but I didn't really see. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so what you have here is the B over D, so you really see some kind of Cantor set structures forming here. No, okay, this is not what they want. Ah. So you see, yeah, it's confusing. So what you see here is this Cantor structure. Now, on the other hand, what you get here are the Ds, which you see, for one given B over D, it could have, uh, uh, let's see how does this work. So, sorry, uh, no, no. Okay. These lines are not quite uh, horizontal, right? So what you get here, um, are the points D. So plotted, let's see, plotted in this graph, you find the pairs uh, D, uh, B over D. So somehow, yeah, and yeah, what? B, B, B is less than D. Yeah, you see, so for different, uh, you can take, uh, uh, these say up to 10,000, right? And then you look at, yeah, all possible, I guess you're looking at all possible B's yeah, mod D. You, for which, of course, A is equal to 2. Can only be one and two, but still there are many. So in fact, you're looking at the, the full set, uh, uh, whatever, of pairs, right? 
So for each pair, you get a dot. And then what you can do is project these dots here, which, you give, which gives you some kind of a counter set. You can also project it there. And somehow, uh, if I have to believe it, you have the impression that you really tend to get all the integers here. OK, so let's not work too hard on that. So in any case, what is the relation with groups? Well, a way to generate the good fractions b over d is by taking products of SL2z matrices of a special kind. So what you do is that you take an alphabet, which is 0, 1, 1, a, where a runs in the, the set. In our case, it would be a going from, say, from 1 uh, up to, uh, to uh, whatever, 50 or 51 or something. So you're taking the semigroup, which is generated by these matrices, and you just uh, project out the lower right corner. In fact, what you can say is that this matrix is going to rep represent a PQ, uh, PN minus 1, QN minus 1, uh, PN, QN, particularly the, the, the Ds which you're getting here are continuance of continued fractions which are generated from partial quotients uh, in, the, in the alphabet here, which is script A. So what we have to understand, it's just a problem of given some orbit, uh, in fact, it's a semigroup orbit, how many integers in, say, in a, it's, it's an orbit uh, in, um, um, in uh, well, you can, you can see it uh, basically, uh, take the semigroup GA, you look at the orbit GAE2, that gives you an orbit in Z2, and you, you project what? E2, just a second, just a second, uh, second coordinate. And you project out uh, the second coordinate to question how many integers you get there. Right, so let me try. So you just take an all You have a collection of matrices. And, and the A's have to be less than 50 or whatever, right? The matrices are generated by, uh, by products so of, of these guys. Yeah. And you just have to have the image. And I want to see what happens with one entry of these matrices, whether they will cover you the whole set of integers. <laughs> so actually, um, the reason why this problem was relatively, in a, in a way, straightforward uh, a posteriori is that we had another result, which is almost what you want, which was kind of a folklore thing. But then all of a sudden, we got an application for it. So this is an, another paper with Kontorovich, which is exactly what you want, but in the group setting. So here, instead of taking a semigroup, we're going to take a subgroup of SL2Z which is uh, finitely generated. No parabolic elements. This is not an issue here. Uh, and we, we're taking, well, I mean, what we're assuming, although this group is not necessarily an, uh, it can be seen in the sense of uh, not being an, an arithmetic uh, group, we're still assuming that it's relatively fat in terms of the dimension of the limit set. We, what we're assuming is that the delta is, suffi is sufficiently close to 1. In fact, the delta, which is here, plays the same role as the dimension of the continued uh, of the Cantor set, the Cantor sets I was talking before. So then we have, indeed, the theorem you want is that if you start looking at one entry, then you're going to have uh, basically everything which is acceptable. So what you can do is talk about a local to global principle where admissible integers d are the ones that at least do not represent any uh, congruence obstructions. <laughs> In other words, uh, for, all, uh, for all q, at least there are going to be some element in your set d, which is going uh, in your set script uh, d, uh, which is going to be um, uh, equal to d mod q. So the reduction mod q of the set script d is going to give you, in particular, uh, the element, the reduction of the element d. So if it fails, it's not for some stupid uh, congruence reason. And then remains the exceptional guys. So the exceptional guys are the ones that pass the, uh, the, the congruence uh, criterion and nevertheless would not be in d. So what we prove is that the d's, which are exceptional in this set, in fact, Form a very tiny uh, sequence with a power saving. Yeah, yeah. What? In the group case, you say. Okay. In the group case, yes, but like I said, don't take this stuff too seriously. Yeah. I know this yeah. 
Well, the truth is that we probably can't save a power, but I'm not 100% sure we didn't really try to help. So now, um, okay, this business about congruence obstructions, I mean, you can start talking about the strong approximation principle, but I'm not going to do that because this is, uh, this is not really relevant. There is no, in, in our problem, there is absolutely no issue about congruence uh, problems. But uh, what I should say is that, say, from the number theoretic uh, point of view, well, to produce these integers, we are using the most brutal method, if you want, which is a circle method. So we are trying to implement the circle method in, in this setting. So the question is how you do that. Uh, the trouble is that in the group setting, so I will tell you, I mean, you are not all number theory, so I will tell you roughly how that, that thing works. Because it's kind of nice to see how the pieces, the ingredients you use in the classical theory are put into place in, in that problem. Because you don't have any obvious uh, uh, way to mimic whatever has been done in some other situations. So the, the most important problem uh, that had to be resolved is that we do not have a group but the semi-group. And a lot of the tools we were using before in the group setting were automorphic. So we have to get out these automorphic things and we have to replace them by thermo thermodynamical things. So if you want to count in groups, there are two methods. Either you go on the automorphic method or you go on the symbolic method. The advantage of the symbolic method is that it's very localized. You only see the, the generating, basically you only see the random walk, and you don't care about the whole group around. Because of course in, in our business, we cannot start inverting elements and things like that. So that kind of technique, in fact, these techniques were developed in, in full detail, and I think this paper is certainly of, of intrinsic interest by itself. In, it's a joint paper with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Alex Kontorovic and, and Peter Sarnak, where we basically uh, develop the counting in, uh, in groups in a fully quantitative form, which is exactly the, the thing which is needed in order to treat, at some point, the major arcs uh, in, the, in the group setting. The trouble is that these, uh, these things are just not available. So we have to get around that. So if you are not number theorists, let me just uh, recall you quickly what is the strategy of the circle method. So basically, what you have is a, a probability distribution on one end, for which you expect that is going to be not only going to represent everything, the support will be everything, but also the, the lambda you expect should have some kind of quite nice regular distribution. I will give you examples of that. So in particular, we want to say that the, the complement, well, the best would be to prove that the support of lambda is all of one end. But and short of being able to do that, what you like to say is that at least the integers that are not in the support of R form a small set. So this is exactly what we were trying to do here. Okay? So what you do, well, you're looking, you, you translate the whole thing in the Fourier language. So you're looking at the Fourier transform of lambda, which you call S theta, which is going to be a function on the circle. And then you start analyzing that function. So the idea is to make an approximation of lambda by splitting the circle in two pieces. So one piece consists of the small neighborhoods of rationals with small denominator, which is usually called the major arcs, and the rest is called the minor arcs. The definition of major arcs carries a parameter b. Now, usually, the larger you can take b, the smaller you're going to make this error term. The price you pay to make b, so what happens when you take b larger is that typically the contribution of the minor arcs are going to get smaller, but the problem is to get some kind of good description on the major arcs, and when b is large, of course, you have many more of them. So you need to control things uh, around rationals with a larger denominator, and also uh, for points which are further away from these rationals. So all that carries uh, requires information on the distribution of lambda, which becomes more and more demanding, of course. So the, the idea is the following. What you do is that you restrict the Fourier transform S theta to the major arcs, and then you take the Fourier transform back. You take the inverse Fourier transform, and what you get is a lambda 1, which is a function uh, on the set 1 up to n, which somehow compares with lambda, 
because obviously the difference between lambda and lambda 1, it's captured by the, the contribution on the minor arcs, at least in the L2 sense. This is just Parseval. So what you like to do is to make sure that the contribution of these minor arcs is going to be small. 1 over n, this is how you say the benchmark. Small means small compared with 1 over n. And if you want to have power savings, then the epsilon n should be like n at the power minus some, some small power. Now, on the other hand, what you like also is to have some explicit description of lambda 1. So in particular, we like to say that lambda 1n is going to be like 1 over n on a set R1, which is basically almost all of the integers, say, or all of the integers. So that then you can conclude that the set R, the difference between n and the size of R, is going to be the same up to an error. And the error is going to be n square root of epsilon, where the epsilon is the one which is there. So this is completely standard. So the, the point is that lambda 1n usually has a structure uh, which is described as a product of densities. So here, the pi n is just a singular integral, which is a, an obvious quantity here in some sense. And then there is also an effect of, of all these rationals with, with small denominator there, which is expressed as an, um, a product of weights over p, where essentially the weights, the, the numbers you have here, sigma p n, they have to do roughly what, what it amounts to is counting uh, the number of representations of n mod p in terms of this measure. So there you just do the, the local reduction and you can calculate these things. So let me uh, tell you, just if you're not familiar with it, one typical problem which looks exactly like at least in spirit, like the type of stuff we, we want to do here, it's the Goldbach problem. So the Goldbach problem, you like to say that every integer is a sum of, even integer is a sum of two primes, and moreover, that they are nicely distributed. So what you do is that, you, of course, you take lambda n to be the usual expression uh, that will describe you the sum of, uh, of two primes. You get the corresponding exponential sum. So then what you see is that well, I mean, you can do a modest truncation. You can go to a power of the logarithm, or you can go beyond that. But let's just keep it modest here. So what you see is that, in fact, uh, on the major arcs, you have a completely explicit description of these exponential sums, which gives you right away an expression for lambda 1n, which is very pleasing. And then on the minor, on, on the minor arcs, what you use are some general techniques, which were particularly developed by Vinogradov, to show that the contribution is going to be small. So in our situation, what is going to happen is that we need two things. First, we need to have a control on the minor arcs. Now, note that Vinogradov bilinear estimates, they came into the picture, especially because there is a way to express sums over primes in terms of some bilinear and multilinear uh, exponential sums. Now, in our case, there is absolutely no trace of any kind of bilinear structure, right? And the reason why you can put a bilinear or a multilinear structure in that is that you have a group or a semigroup. So here I'm going to use, in a very crude form, the fact that I have a group. It's just to set up some bilinear or multilinear uh, expressions. What? Yeah. Well, they can be improved a lot, but I mean, no. I did, what, what is it? What do you say? Here? Here? Uh, oh, there is an n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I told you there are many misprints. In any case, uh, I have to divide by n. You're absolutely right. Uh, sorry for that. In any case, the, the main thing comes from the, the first part here, which is certainly going to be positive, with, in fact, something which is more or less of, of the order of 1 over n most of the time. But you see, the problem is that to write that kind of gadget here, there is something involved, which is an understanding of the primes in, uh, in arithmetic progressions, basically, which comes from the theory of Dirichlet L functions. So in our problem, we will have to understand whatever sits in this semigroup within a certain ball, within a certain box, and after reduction mod Q. So how do you do that? So this is exactly where the uh, well, I mean, in the group case, it was a spectral input that does it. Now, we don't have the group situation anymore. And instead of using the spectral methods, what we're going to use is a thermodynamical method. 
which in fact was also has been developed earlier in the group setting and you have to move it over uh, to the I to the semi group setting very Yes, yes. So that you have to, you actually have to average over n. Yes, so yes. yes. That's correct. That was for them to see itself all n. Yes. yes. Yeah, in fact, this method cannot work for all n. Yes. In this case. No, how do we put that into the picture? <laughs> well, I want to show you something a little bit. Okay, no. I want to show you something about the problem we are dealing with, right? So essentially, what we are going to make is an exponential sum. So remember that we have to pick off the lower right corner. So these are the gamma E2s E2. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any choice there. This is the set of numbers we are dealing with. What's, uh, what's the issue is where we are going to take the gamma. So we are going to make some special sets of matrices the following way. Basically, the set omega n, these are going to be matrices in my semigroup, which are of norm around uh, size n. We are going to make them as products of certain building blocks, which I call lambda j. So the lambda j's, uh, they are uh, as follows. So the, the, for a given number, say capital L, what I do is that I introduce a set lambda L, which is a subset of the semigroup with some properties. So first of all, we know that the maximal size, if I want the elements of lambda L uh, to be of norm uh, about L, the maximal size lambda L can have its L at the power 2 delta. So this is just a little bit smaller. Uh, moreover, what I also want in order to, to make sure that uh, the norm of the product is the product of the norms, roughly speaking, is that the expanding vectors are all pointing in the same direction, more or less. Uh, and then I want the norm, which is the Lyapunov exponent here, to be about L. So I start with that, and later I will need more properties. But at this stage, these are the only properties uh, I want. Now, what is very important is that this delta here is close to 1. The loss of logarithmic factors is not, not significant, because anyway, uh, I already deal with the delta, which is less than 1. But it has to be close to 1. So what we do is that we build an ensemble by taking products of these lambda j's where the, so the, the, the lambda sets corresponding to, to L equals nj and the nj is chosen to be roughly n at the power 2 minus j. So the effect of that is that uh, the size of omega n is going to be, the product of the sizes is going to be basically the largest you can hope for, n at the power 2 delta up to something small, I mean, up to a little loss I don't care about. The norms are going to be about n. Uh, note, maybe I should have told you that, that is, is, uh, what, what happens is that when I give you the B over D, so I give you the second column of the matrix, of course, you can look at the continued fraction expansion of B over D. So you know the AJs. So automatically, you know the representation of that matrix as a product in the semigroup. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence there. Anyway, now what I want to do is give you just an idea how you deal with these minor arcs using, so it's important that I have this multilinear structure. So this Vinogradov stuff is going to come into the game because of this multilinear structure. So I'm sorry, going back to previous slide. So, so is, this, is this something that you have to work for to get this is the size of omega n? Uh, no, this is trivial. What, what you have to work a little bit for is that. So you already use, say, an embryonic form of the thermodynamical method in order to get that kind of stuff. You can probably do it without. But afterwards, what I will also need are distributions of this at lambda in, uh, in congruence classes. When you do a reduction mod Q, and then you have to work much more. But at this stage, I only will use this crude information. I didn't want to put all the conditions on lambda L, because then it looks horrible, and at that stage, you don't need it. The only thing I need, basically, is to have something which is very large and also something that has the property that when you start multiplying, the norm of the product is the product of the norm. Okay, now what I'm doing is the following. So I break up the minor arcs in, 
in regions. So the WQK means thetas which are uh, close uh, to a rational A over Q with Q of the order of, of capital Q, and so that beta is small like uh, K, capital K over N. So when the Q and the K are small, then you have very small, I mean, uh, how do you say, major arcs which are very small neighborhoods of uh, rationals with small denominator, and then when QK go up, you're going down, down the hill. In any case, so how do we estimate the exponential sum on a WQK, uh, on a theta in WQK? Well, what you do, let's say, for instance, assume that K, Q uh, are between 1 and N at the power 5 over 52. What I'm doing then is that I single out the J, where the NJ lies between these two numbers, which you can do because of the construction. Then the ensemble omega can be written as the product of three pieces. There is omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, where omega 1 and omega 2 have a size which is about nj at the power 2 delta, and the norm of the elements in omega 1, omega 2 are about nj, which is nj there, because of construction. And then there is a large piece which I call omega 3. So what you do is that by moving the, the matrix elements from one side to another by transposition is that you rewrite S and theta as a sum over J1. I will take J1 fixed here. And then I have a sum over J2 and over J3 in the respective sets uh, omega 2 and, um, and uh, omega 3. I'm wondering whether, let's see. Um, in fact, uh, let me see. Yes, this is correct. Uh, sorry, I take it back. So I, I rewrite my sum simply by taking the sum for J1 in omega 1, and then I take the double sum over omega 2 and over omega 3. Now, the ones I'm going to play with are the omega 1 and the omega 2. Okay? These are elements which are about of size nj. Uh, what I will do, uh, is right, um, let me see what I did there, uh, is this correct? Um, in fact, I may have, let's see, um, I may have uh, J1, J2, J3, uh, let's see. I believe what happened is that I, I, mis I, I mixed up the, the, one, the 1 and the 3 here. So let's take this thing over. Uh, what I'm going to do is take J1. So the J1 is the one with the large norm. The J2, J3 are the ones of norm uh, NJ. So what I'm going to do is fix J1 star eta 2 and call this eta, which is a vector in Z2. Then I'm going to take the sum over omega 2 and over omega 3. The point being that basically you should, you should permute uh, these two guys here. Uh, that omega 2, omega 3, they are of norm, and elements are of norm nj. And when you're looking at the, say, for instance, the j3 e2, what you have there, so you have a subset of z2, which consists of elements of norm nj, and the number of elements is almost maximal. So the maximum number of elements would be nj squared. Now, I don't quite have nj squared. I have nj at the power of 2 delta. Still, this is a quite large set. So that expression can be written down as a bilinear expression in x and y, where the distributions mu and nu, they just come from projecting, from, from looking at the images g3 e2 and uh, uh, g2 star eta. Now, let's say, let's take the beta to be 0. So the, the theta here should just be a rational a over q. So what you should see there is a reduction of, um, uh, of g3 and G2 mod Q, basically. Now, what's important when you try to estimate non-trivially such, such bilinear sum is to know how the mu and the nu are going to behave mod Q. And essentially, you want to have some distribution which is as spread out as possible. So what we know is that, uh, basically, the mu distribution is going to give you a full ball of size nj, so you have nj square elements. Well, not quite, but at least a density, say, which is an nj at the power 2 delta. The way it works is that you just do Cauchy-Schwarz, you put absolute values inside here, and then you estimate the, the sum of the mu x 
uh, by, by Cauchy Schwartz, which eventually replaces you the weighted sum by an unweighted sum. Now, um, if, you a little, if you are a little bit familiar with that, you will right away see that if you do this scheme, in the best case, if you would have a delta save which is 1, the saving you're going to get is 1 over q. In fact, the standard uh, Vinograd of inequality, when you apply it to the primes, the saving is 1 over square root of q because it's one-dimensional. Here, the saving, uh, because it's a two-dimensional thing, is going to be at the best 1 over q. Now, if you think a second about it, this is just not enough to handle this problem. So although, I mean, basically the, what you want to do is, is kind of straightforward. If you do, if you do the usual bilinear form thing, you're just going to miss it. So there is something more there to be done that I will not explain you here because it's too technical. You have to get a little bit over 1 over q. Why, wh why over 1 over q? Because 1 over q is going to be square summable over the major arcs. Over, say, not over the major, over, the, the, over all the, the arcs. Because there is an extra factor q there, or phi q there, which comes from the number of residues mod q. So let it be uh, what I just told you. What you can do is show that the contribution in L2 of the minor arcs is going to be small with a saving in k and q, which is power-like, and which, in fact, without even talking about major arcs, just because here I can let k and q start from any large numbers, from any large integers, uh, what I can get uh, is, an, um, is a statement which would be already a positive proportion. Because I can really make sure that the contribution of the, uh, of the minor arcs, so the complement of the, major, uh, of the major arcs, is going to be small compared with the, how do you say, the, the main contribution I'm expecting, which is uh, omega n squared over n. So essentially, you can reduce the major arcs to, um, uh, to, the, to a, well, I mean, you can just drop major arcs and just use on the bound I have, the bound I have here. In fact, if I drop the m all together, I would have a bound which is a constant omega n square over n. And that really would already imply that I have a positive proportion. But we want more, we want to have a density one set. So the major arcs analysis requires you to understand uh, this exponential sum when theta is close to a rational. So like in the, in the Goldbach problem, what it means is that the, the distribution has to be understood from a joint, say, Archimedean, say, metric and modular point of view. So instead of understanding primes in an arithmetic progression, mod Q, we have to understand the, the semi-group in a, in a ball reduced mod Q. So this is what is done uh, using uh, the um, thermodynamical method. I should keep track of the time. Uh, so the main lemma, remember I told you about the, set, the sets uh, earlier on here. Uh, where are these sets here? Uh, the set uh, lambda L. Okay. So the lambda L here had only these this few properties. But now I want to construct the sets lambda L. Also, well, I need more precise Archimedean properties and also especially more precise uh, modular properties. So the main lemma is that we have the following. So the way you make the sets is just by counting in the full semigroup. So what is here is that, so let's, um, uh, let's make it simple. So let's take, so there is a Q0. This Q0 has nothing to do with the strong approximation property. It just has to do with the, the technical, uh, whatever, the, the technical details of how this technique works that we need to take a Q with sufficiently large primes or something, okay? So let's make it simple. Uh, forget about the second statement. I'll take the first. So there is a Q0 that will only depend on A. So that if I take Q here, which is co-prime with Q0, and I'm looking at the elements gamma in my group, or here it's a semigroup, so I'm taking gamma in the semigroup. Now, what I want about the gamma? Well, remember the old property, the expanding vector of gamma has to be more or less, expanding direction has to be more or less specified. Then I also want some control on lambda gamma to be more or less specified. Here I want even more. I want lambda gamma to be close to, say, some number t, 
with an approximation h that may be small compared with t. This has to do with a better control uh, of, the, um, of the Archimedean uh, uh, component. And then most importantly, I want to specify gamma uh, mod q. So what happens is that you're going to have a main term here, which is the one you expect. So the price of specifying mod q means that you're going to cut by 1 over SL2q if everything goes well. The total number of elements, if I wouldn't put these two restrictions, but only the restriction that lambda gamma is less than t, well, you, go, you would have a t to the power 2 delta here. Now, with this restriction, you're going to have t to delta minus 1 times h. And then there is the, the price uh, of restricting the expanding vector to the interval i, uh, which is expressed by a measure mu of i, and the, the, the mu is, is the, the analog of the sullivan patterson measure on the limit set in the context of the thermodynamic thing. And we have an error term, which is an honest error term, not quite with a power saving, almost, which will tell you that whatever this main term is, is okay, I mean, it's, it's relevant, as long as the Q is not too small and the H, the Q is not too large and the H is not too small. So I guess, how much time do I have? Zero? Zero, okay. Five minutes, huh? So what you do here is, so I'm going to go a little fast, right? So, uh, so far I went very slow. So you have the symbolic technique, uh, which was developed by many people, uh, where basically you forget about the group or the semi-group, and you start counting the thing symbolically on a tree. So how do you do that? Well, the key point is that there is um, some... Um, uh, counting device which is uh, introduced there, uh, which is based on uh, the, the function. So essentially f here is going to be distortion function. And what you can do is set up the counting by using some devices which I call n phi tx. You, there is no time to analyze them. But the main point about n phi tx is that it satisfies trivially some interesting relation which is called the renewal equation. Now, this renewal equation has the following interest, that if you take the Laplace transform, then eventually the Laplace transform of this counting function boils down to understanding the resolvent of the Ruel transfer operator. <coughs> so this Ruel transfer operator um, is the one which is introduced here symbolically so essentially what you do, this, this operator looks a little bit like, a, like an, an averaging operator, a heck operator, with a certain weight. And this weight is what allows me to capture the, the Archimedean component in the problem. So eventually all the... How do you choose this weight? Uh, well, the weight is chosen in the usual uh, uh, setting. It is uh, taken uh, to be the logarithm of the derivative uh, of the, how do you call it, um, uh, Basically, it's a distortion function. So here what you do um, is the, the, the weight, let's see, which is chosen is the following. You take the hyperbolic distance. You look at the action. You take a hyperbolic plane centered at i. Then x is a, is a word, which means a matrix. You look at the hyperbolic distance of x i i to the hyperbolic distance of sigma x i i. So the x is a string, x1, x2, x3, etc. The sigma x is the string x2, x3, etc., where these are matrices. So what you see is that when you add them up, if you're looking at the cos cycle, um, which is here, this is, is going to, to give you, in fact, the distance you want. It's going to give the hyperbolic distance corresponds to the, uh, uh, to the Arch Archimedean distance. So th this is what corresponds to what they call the distortion function. What's very important is that this function is non-lattice, so eventually this is SNF, this SN of tau, is going to become eventually positive. This is a crucial thing to drive this Lally method. But anyway, uh, the whole point is that you want to study this resolvent. Now, this resolvent is going to be definitely an analytic function to the right real part of, uh, of, uh, of z bigger than delta. And what you want to do is understand it on an extended strip. To describe the group phase. To describe, yes. Uh, what did you say? To describe the what? The group? group Yes. <laughs> uh, you are describing the group case, not the 
No, I'm describing the semi-group case. It doesn't see the difference between the symbolic thing. Doesn't see anything. So you extended the Dolgopiat method. The Dolgopiat uh, no thing has nothing to to do with uh, what. Well, I mean, it only captures the Archimedean part, and this is just a statement about uh, the behavior of the uh, of the transfer operator, which is associated to a system of uh, of elements. This has not. This doesn't use the group structure. Now, I'm trying to point out the exponential gain which Dolgopiat might offer you. Yeah. Well, this is okay. This is not. not yet, no. No. What I'm saying here is that this is the original result of Lally. Well, the. No. No. Lally is completely symbolic. You see, the first part of Lally's paper, it's a symbolic setup, and then he applies it to uh, uh, whatever Fuchsin or Schottky groups uh, later on. Okay. So what I'm you, you see, the, the Lally theory, uh, theorem is an abstract theorem. So what, what were you asking? I, I'm interested in where the poles, what's relevant here is where the, the poles of the Borel operator are, which controls all Right. So there is a pole in delta, and then what you get eventually is a, more, is a meromorphic extension to a uh, strictly larger strip. Now, what Lally proved in his abstract setting is that you're going to have a pole at this, uh, at this uh, delta, which comes, I mean, this basically this Ruel theory is an abstract theory in some sense. Uh, so uh, this is where exactly the pressure function is going to vanish. So delta is the multiple of the distortion function, which will make the pressure function vanish. So in other words, if you are on the right, you get a spectral radius which is less than 1. So the resolvent is an analytic function. So what uh, Lally proved is that you can find a neighborhood of real z bigger than delta, <coughs> some neighborhood, not a full strip, where you have an, uh, an analytic continuation. And this is an abstract theorem. There's just a pole there. Just a pole. What? continuous spectrum. I'm not talking about spectrum. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the resolvent. Right. So there is a little neighborhood. OK, so what Dolgopiat did was basically doing this analysis. I mean, uh, this is part of uh, has several results in, in this direction, but essentially introducing something they call Dolgopiat operators, which really allows you to capture the powers of the Ruel operator in the complex plane. Because the whole problem is to understand what happens here. So you need a method to do that much more efficiently. So this is a very non-trivial piece of work, which was taken up later by No to get the, the statements in the group setting. And the power of that is that it really allows to extend things to real z bigger than, say, some, some delta minus epsilon over a full strip. So all I'm, just to repeat my question, is that the reason you're not getting a power saving in your theorem is this source here that you don't have this extension in the semi-group case, or am I wrong? No, you're wrong. Okay, why? <laughs> because the problem is, and this is what we did in uh, our other paper is that we had to introduce another component which is the which is the modular component the mod q so we have to introduce a transfer operator uh, on an enlarged space which is sigma times sl2q and basically we have to uh, treat we have to estimate powers of the of the of the real transfer operator now in the space, uh, in, in, in a space which is vector valued in SL2Q in order to control the resolvent. So now there are two parts. There is the scalar part, which means that we don't have a dependence on the Q variable here, so it's just Archimedean. So that is Dolgopiat no, Lali Dolgopiat no. But you also have to take care of what is the effect of the, of the Q aspect. And this is, well, I mean, in the geometric setting, you would uh, uh, call it uh, whatever the... Uh, so the, that comes, the, the, the lock-lock uh, factor there comes from understanding the, uh, the Q behavior. 
And why, yes, why does it come in uh, there is that, um, well, basically you see the right way to do it. So what is the main input there, I should say? What is there really is the full theory of expansion SL2Q with Q unrestricted, which means the, the work in the original paper with, uh, with, uh, with Alex and, and Peter, and then also because we need full Q, because it's not enough when you want to do circle method, it's not enough to deal with square free Q, so we need all Qs, so developments with, uh, with Gouge and so on. So there is some big theory there, which is really about expansion uh, on the combinatorial side. And then, well, you, there is a way, I guess it has been done in the in a ge in geometric setting by people like, uh, well, in our paper and before by people like, like Burgers and Brooks or whatever, you have to move this combinatorial gap to some gap, say, on the geometric level, either for the Laplacian or for our gadget here, which is this, uh, uh, this, this transfer operator thing. So basically, we are not using Dolgopiat anymore. We are only getting the information from the, um, uh, from the basically the, the spectral gap in the, in, the expansion, uh, in the expander graphs. And there, there is a loss there, which is a double logarithmic loss somehow. Um, now, I'm not sure whether that can be removed or not. Uh, I'm afraid you may have to combine the, the two techniques and put in the Dolgopia together with the expander graph. So I think I have to stop right. Um.